Well, I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. We welcome you to T.L. Elliott Ministries uh, Bible Study. I am Apostle Elliott to some, Dr. Elliott to others. And tonight, 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 we start a brand new journey with another book of the Old Testament and not only a book, but I believe everything that has been written for the record that we still have, even in this dispensation of time, according to the Lord, I believe is profound or prolific uh, to our understanding going forward. Uh, and in that, even as I get ready to give the introduction of this particular book on tonight, uh, I state once again, it's easy to teach uh, much of the Bible from our natural understanding. But I believe in this dispensation or in this, this administration, this period of time, uh, that with us being, as many people would say, a New Testament church because we're charismatic, because we're passionate about the word of the Lord more so than ever before, especially more so than the people of the Old Testament. I believe that the Lord has us in a place of saying, I want you to be in balance. And as I refer to balance, I'm referring to having just as much spiritual understanding of the scripture as we have natural or literal understanding. Many people have heard me say before, and I'll say it again, we're often so obese in natural understanding that it causes us to be anorexic in spiritual so in that I believe the Lord is calling me to teach this particular book from a spiritual perspective uh, to bring you more depth of revelation. Because see, when we began to look at the word of the Lord more from the spiritual than we do in the natural, and I'm not dismissing the natural. However, what I am saying is if we're planning to go to be with a God who is spiritual, then it's going to require us to have spiritual understanding yoked to our natural comprehension. And so in that, prayerfully, the Lord will bless my mouth as I continue to go forward in this teaching um, in a spiritual perspective to give as much revelation to add to it and see as we look at it from the spiritual format, then we as believers in this period of time will be able to wrap the word around ourselves and see it speaking in our now. Um, oftentimes, because we lack spiritual understanding of text, we began to look at the Bible as a history book and we began to say those people, we disconnect ourselves. Uh, but the thing is, there are spiritual forefathers, there are spiritual ancestors. So when we can understand and look from that perspective, we can now begin to digest the book and say, wait a minute, this is my spiritual family. These are some of the things they did good. These are the things they did bad. These are the things that are indifferent. But if I am to be better, if I am to be on the course to make it to my destiny, which is my divine destiny in the Lord, i.e. eternity, then I need to learn from my forefathers. I need to learn and, and allow my understanding to take me to a place that will bring me uh, in alignment with the steps that I take in my divine destiny to getting to the Lord. Unfortunately, many people don't look from that perspective and oftentimes we will repeat the mistakes of history. And when we repeat the mistakes of history, that's why the world has the cliche, history repeats itself. So see, we have to be trendsetters as believers. We have to be ones that break the mold of not falling into the trend of being under the mindset of unrighteousness by not learning from the word. We should let the word make us better because as we say, when you know better, you do better. So based upon that, tonight I begin a new series regarding a book in the Old Testament. And the book that I'm referring to, many people may have not have heard a lot of people uh, uh, teach from this particular book. But the book I'm referring to is Obadiah. Obadiah. Now, before I can begin to uh, teach 
the text in order to bless you, hopefully from a spiritual perspective. Let me give a little bit of a background regarding this particular book. Uh, first of all, let me look at the prophet. And the prophet that is speaking, once again, is Obadiah. Uh, his name in the Hebrew means servant or prophet or slave of the Lord. So, so in this, understanding the Hebrew, when we say prophet, uh, the word prophet is Ibed. Okay, now notice that Ibed is like Obed, which is the first part of the name of the prophet, in which Obed or Ibed is the word for servant or prophet. Now, the end of his name, Yah, is, of course, as we can understand out of the Hebrew, a shortened variation of the name Yah or Yahweh, uh, which we understand is for the Lord God. So now we can understand the name Obadiah Yah, meaning servant or prophet, because a prophet is a servant unto the Lord. All right. Now, also, what we can look in the Hebrew is the understanding of the name meaning one in the same worshiper of Yahweh, because one who serves Yahweh or prophesies for Yahweh is one who is submitting to worshiping because see one of the functions of the prophet is their worship of the Lord that gives them utterance from the Lord. So in this, this is, is the depth that yokes itself, first of all, to the name of the prophet. Now, if one was looking in the Septuagint, and the Septuagint is the Greek translation of uh, the Old Testament uh, scripture, it would be obdios or obdio. Uh, in the Latin Vulgate, which for some that may be theological historians, you will come to discover the Latin Vulgate is the first complete translation of the Old and New Testament from the Greek. But in that, under the Latin, his name is Abdias, A-B-D-I-A-S, Abdias. But once again, all correlate to what his name uh, speaks to and see once again let me bring this to your attention because oftentimes uh, many people miss it when we're looking at names in the Bible and forget the fact that a name speaks to a characteristic or a reputation the name if I can give you profound revelation is what the Lord calls to do his will. And the reason I say the name is what the Lord calls is because the name uh, in most instances, as we look at the prophets of the Old Testament and even some of the names of the apostles of the New Testament, their name speaks to a characteristic within the Lord God. So notice that the prophet's name means servant or slave or prophet of God, meaning mouthpiece or worshiper unto the Lord God or Yahweh. So in that, then when it comes to Obadiah, here's a profound revelation that someone may be learning on tonight. The Lord God does not call or give the assignment to a man who has a name the Lord God gives the assignment to the name that's on the man. So uh, if somebody's really getting a, a real revelation, even in the introductory of this, it's not the man who happened to be named Obadiah that the Lord is giving the vision to for this particular writing. It's the Obadiah in the man that is receiving the vision because his name is a characteristic that answers to the frequency or the voice of the Lord God because it's only uh, the characteristic of the Lord God within us that answers or matches the Lord God who's calling it. Okay, I hope I'm I'm really teaching somebody here in the introductory of this so that you got a little bit more depth, especially when you're studying the scripture and you're beginning to look at who's the writer and who is the writer writing to. Now you begin to understand why the writer operates the way that they do, because according to the scripture, it's their name that speaks to their character and their character is what's carrying out the function of the message that they've received in order to deliver to the people. 
So now, in conjunction with that, when we look in the totality of this one chapter, this book is not long, it's only one chapter, 21 verses, we find that Obadiah's message uh, occurs both within his own time setting as well as ours when we look at it from the spiritual perspective. And what we come to discover is not only is the prophet declaring a message of hope for the people in that time, he's declaring a message for hope in the people of our time as well when it comes to being in the midst of a national catastrophe. Now, notice that I use the word declare even in the midst of this, and I, I uh, hopefully I can teach you something here. To declare is not just to say something, but when we look at that word declare uh, out of the Hebrew or the Greek, it means to repeat or to recite, okay? So in that, the prophet, when they're declaring something, is not just a one-time hit. It means that they're repeating what they are saying or reciting or rehearsing it over and over and over again, which is why even in this time, for those who are becoming learned of the word, that's why as old as the word is in its original insemination, it speaks to your now because you keep reading it and reciting it that makes it now come into your present and become alive to speak to your future. So, so in this, uh, still giving you a little bit of the, of the background because I believe you need to have this in order for you to be able to really get in and get the revelation that comes from the text in order to move and use it for the best interest of your destiny in the Lord. So in this, once again, the message that he is speaking is really a message of hope in a time of Notice national catastrophe and national catastrophe that we're referring to is not necessarily a nation like we understand in the Western world. We'll we'll say Russia is a nation, Japan is a nation, China, uh, etc. We define nation by geographical territories, but that is not so according to the word of the Lord. When we talk about nations, we're talking about Gentiles. When we're talking about Gentiles, Gentiles means heathen. Uh, to imply those who are foreign to the Lord God based on also being foreign to worshiping him. See, those who have no relationship with him, those who have no covenant with him, he's foreign to them. Even though they're not foreign to the Lord God because he knows each and every one as we believe by our faith. But in the context of where we stand to him, if we have no relationship with him, we're foreigners to him. And as foreigners, we have the potential to continue to be heathen because we have no guidance of moral or ethic according to a word that the Lord has already decreed or declared to be the foundation of our thinking process. So in that, as long as we don't have his word and have no connection with him, we are considered to be foreign to him. So in this, as foreigners, then the message of hope, the, the, the message of potential, the message of possibility continues to be spoken. Now, Obadiah never fails to remind his readers when we began to look at this, this, this book very closely, uh, that the end time of in Israel, which Israel is nothing more than the descendants of Jacob or Yaakob, who is the brother of Esau. He, he declares here that they will receive back everything that was taken from them or they're going to uh, be in a place of recompense or be restored for the ill treatment of their own brethren. Now, I, I emphasize that because what's, what's very interesting that we will discover as we begin to look at the book of Obadiah is Obadiah falls in sequence with the words of Amos, with the books of words of Joel, uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, minor prophets and major prophets, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Daniel, 
all of them deal with a judgment that is to come upon the people of the Lord God. And in the judgment that comes upon the people of the Lord God, it's not only about a restoration of those who've lost their way. It's about also uh, putting the people that are in wrong standing who are uh, Gentiles or of the nations in right standing or on the right path. I know some people haven't looked very closely when we talk about repentance. Um, the Hebrew word for repentance is shub and shub has two definitions to it. It means to turn back or turn towards. So in that, if I can just sidebar teach here, because you'll kind of see where this comes to light, even in this particular book. To uh, turn back is in context to those who have a relationship with the Lord that just lost their way and they need to be restored. To turn towards is in regards to those who are foreign, foreigners to the Lord God who need to be put on the right trajectory to begin with. Okay, so that's why it has two contextual meanings based upon who you're talking about. So, so in that, let me still continue to give you a little bit more of depth here about Obadiah and his message. Uh, once again, uh, he speaks as we look at this chapter out of these 21 verses, we will come to the conclusion of understanding of what the Lord God will do to restore the mistreatment or the loss unto his people, Israel. Now, let me also remind you something significant about Israel. In the name change of Jacob or Jacob to Israel, uh, the name Israel means he who the Lord has prevailed with or he who the Lord has been successful with in their life. So now, as I say that, you can begin to look at yourself as a believer saying, okay, this is bigger than a people uh, that was just in the Bible in the time period of the writers. Basically, this engrafts me when the Lord prevails or is successful in my life because he's now the lead. So now understanding, you know what I'm saying? When you come from your Jacob state, when you come from your, your, your trickster state, when you come from your state uh, of being an overtaker or one who circumvents each and every other to get ahead and you remember your place by letting the Lord take first place, now it speaks to you as an Israel. Now, in conjunction with that, the book of Obadiah, uh, he is considered the oracle concerning the divine or the godly judgments of Edom. Once again, as I said before, Edom is all the descendants of Esau, which is the brother of Jacob, as we can understand from Genesis. And in, in conjunction with that, the restoration, as I said a few minutes ago, of Israel, which is all the descendants of Jacob. Now, Obadiah also, let me bring something else to your attention. Obadiah is one of what is considered the 12 minor prophets of uh, the Old Testament in what is considered the final section of the Nevi'im and the second main division of the Tanakh. Now, for those who may not be familiar, those who may not be theologians, uh, uh, don't worry, I'm going to articulate these to you. When we talk about the Tanakh, the Tanakh is the uh, Hebrew canon of the Bible. Then when we talk about the Nabaim, it is in regards to the prophets and the Keturvim is the writings. So, so when you look at uh, uh, the Tanakh, and let me give you one other portion, is the Torah, which is the law. As we understand the first five books that were written by Moses, we call the Torah or the Torah. So technically, the Tanakh is composed of three different key elements, the Torah, the Nava'im, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings. OK, now, only other thing that I will bring to your attention is 
Uh, if anyone is asking themselves where Edom is located, it's in a region in ancient Israel, but what we would probably call Palestine today. It's in the southwestern region of the Jordan between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Agaba. So that gives you a little bit of the geographical, that gives you a little bit of background about Obadiah, and it gives you a little bit of background about the people that he's prophesying about in this particular book. So now in that, let us begin to get into the text. And as we get into the text, we will come to discover that there are technically four significant segments to this chapter. For those who want to know or understand what those four are, verses one through nine, when we began to look at it, we will begin to see Obadiah's prediction of the judgment upon Edom or the descendants of Esau. When we get to verses 10 through 14, we will begin to see the reason for the judgment against Edom. When we get to verses 15 through 18, we will see the results of the judgment on Edom. And then in verse 19 through 21, we will see the possession of Edom by Israel. Amen. So in that, as I've given you that historical and I've given you a little bit of the background that this whole chapter contains let us begin to now dissect the text and see what we discover, see what we began to understand about the writing of Obadiah, uh, not only for the children of Israel and for Edom, but how it speaks to us spiritually uh, in the now. Amen. So for those of you that have the word of the Lord with you with me on tonight, turn to Obadiah which Obadiah is located right after the book of Amos and before the book of Jonah. Uh, and let us look at the first verse. And when we look at the first verse, it says, and I'm reading to you all from the standard King James Version. The scripture says, the vision of Obadiah, period. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. Now, let us first look at this verse because believe it or not, there's some real meat that's just here in this one verse. First of all, let us look at the first section of the verse. It says, the vision of Obadiah, period. Now, what is it saying to us right here? Well, here's the thing that you got to understand. This, what's interesting is this verse didn't say the word of the Lord came to Obadiah. It says the vision of Obadiah. So it's a vision that he's receiving, but watch this, understand. The, the Hebrew word for vision that's used in this verse is shazon, which means revelation. All right. So in this, this particular writing is about a revelation that Obadiah has. What is a revelation? Uh, it means to reveal something. But watch this. Apparently, Obadiah is having this revelation or this revealing to him based on information and observation. Listen to what I'm saying. Based on information and observation, the prophet now has a revelation. Because, see, understand, even when it, when it comes to revelation of the Lord, the Lord gives revelation based upon truth of understanding that one gets. Amen. So that means you first got to get some information downloaded into you in order to observe that information coming into fruition in order to now paint the picture for you to have an understanding of what it is as a message that you're supposed to receive. So in this, Obadiah is operating off of a revelation, which is information and observation. So in this, it says, 
the vision of Obadiah, thus said the Lord concerning Edom. All right. So in this, what he says is Obadiah is in a place that he's got a little news or information about Edom. He knows a little bit about the descendants of Esau. And not only does he know something about them, but he's had the opportunity to observe how they operate. So in this, it says, we have heard a rumor from the Lord and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Now, in this, notice that Obadiah says, we have heard a rumor, meaning we've heard a report. We've heard some news, some, some news has traveled that we've got wind of. And now in this, what's very interesting about what Obadiah is saying about we've heard a rumor, this same portion of scripture pops up again in the Bible. What I want to bring to your attention, if you hold your finger there in Obadiah, I would like for you to turn with me quickly to the book of Jeremiah. And when you turn to the book of Jeremiah, what we find is very profound is in the 49th chapter, verses 14 through 16. If I can read them to you, listen to this. It says, I have heard a rumor from the Lord and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen saying, gather ye together and come against her and rise up to the battle. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just read that here in the book of Obadiah? But yet, verse 15, For lo, I will make thee small among the heathen and despised among men. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee and the pride of thy heart. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Now, what we're going to discover as we begin to exhaust this chapter of Obadiah is, could it be that the rumor that is being heard is the fact that Jeremiah and Obadiah are on the scene pretty much in the same or familiar uh, time frame in which they both have a segment of the same word within themselves based on the vision that they've received. Listen, 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 listen. So, so that means Obadiah is not the only one declaring or repeating these particular verses in the atmosphere at the time that he's prophesying. We find Jeremiah has the same uh, revelatory words that he's speaking based upon the news that he's got. Okay, so now listen, it says the vision of Obadiah, thus said the Lord concerning Edom or Esau. Uh, and um, for those who don't know, Esau's name is also Asav, which means mankind. And it also associates itself uh, with one who does things or executes or completes something the hard way. So now keep that in mind. This is a word for Edom. This is a word for Esau. This is a word for the hairy one. This is the one, a word for those who do things the hard way. Okay. It says, we have heard, meaning we have listened and obeyed, or we've taken heed based on the report or the news that we've gotten from the Lord and an ambassador, meaning a messenger or a heralder a preacher, one who is sent to represent. It says is sent or, or, and in the term sent that's used here, it is shalak in Hebrew, which means to be sent away or to be sent out or to be dispatched. So the ambassador, based on the news that has come, uh, an ambassador has come out and brought the news or has been sent from uh, uh, or, or has been sent among or to the heathen, to the Gentiles, to the foreigners, uh, to those who don't know no better or don't have a relationship. And it says, arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. All right. So what is it saying right here? 
it's the, the scripture is saying, take a stand now and let us rise up against her in battle. Now to rise up here is implying take a stand in morals or in ethics or in character to do battle or to do warfare or to go against what is unrighteous regarding the character of Esau or the character of Edom. This is the setting that the prophet is giving. Uh, and, and, and you think about this, not only is Obadiah saying this now, when we as believers, as I say, look at this from the spiritual perspective, it begins to speak to us as we look around and we say, wait a minute, I, I, I'm looking around and there's a lot of people that are around me in my community, in my city, in my state, in my region, in my, in my country that are rebellious, that keep warring against the simple way of accepting and submitting to God. They want to do things the hard way. So in that, I, as a believer, it's declaring I have to take a stand. I can't compromise and continue to go with the flow of being rebellious like those that are around me. What it is saying is I have to take a stand and taking a stand is not just me standing up physically. What it's implying is that there has to be some morals and some ethics and some characteristics according to the Lord God that I stand up for or that I represent. This is what the prophet is declaring based on the vision. And see, watch this. That means that vision is still alive now. It's not nothing that I had to have an audible conversation by the Lord. It's something that even we can observe as a revelation based on the information or the understanding that we have of the word of the Lord God from now. This is what it, what it, what it says. So now let us look at verse two. Let us look at verse two of this chapter. It says, behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Now, remember the prophet is giving the vision and it's in the context of the judgment against Edom but in the good favor towards Israel, those he's prevailed with. So watch, the first thing he says, which once again, as I articulated a few minutes ago about teaching this from a spiritual perspective, look, the first word in verse two is behold. Behold means to discern. Turn on spiritual or prophetic eyesight or understanding. It, it, it means turn off natural thinking and come into spiritual so that you can really understand what's happening beyond what you naturally see. So it says, behold, I have made or bestowed upon thee a, uh, uh, to be small. Now, what it, it's implying here to the children of Israel is that the Lord God said, I have made thee or I have bestowed upon thee that you are insignificant among the heathen, meaning that you're not important. Because see, the word small is katan, Q-A-T-O-N in Hebrew, which means insignificant, meaning that you're not important, that, that uh, uh, nobody's paying attention to you. Uh, uh, you're minuscule. You you have no 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 great significance in the midst of what is occurring in, in in the territory or in the mindset of those who are rebellious. So he says, uh, "I've made you insignificant among the Gentiles, among the foreigners. Uh, what makes you insignificant is the character that you have that is significantly." Uh, shaped upon the character of the Lord God. So it means based upon what you represent, the rest of the world ain't feeling you. 
based upon what you're trying to do and stay in alignment with worshiping and being in fellowship or covenant with the Lord God, it's not uh, uh, something famous. It's not in the in crowd. Uh, it's something that's looked upon as unimportant. It's something that's looked upon uh, uh, that doesn't go in the flow of success of what is considered successful among society. So in this, he says, I made you insignificant unto the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Now, watch this. He articulates how you're insignificant here in the verse. It's not that you're not important, but it's the fact that you have been made non-important or insignificant based on the fact that you have been despised. You've been talked about. You've been scorned. You've been considered to be worthless versus uh, uh, full of worth. Everything about you uh, has no value that adds to those who aren't like you. And so be it that you're not like the rest of the world, they discredit you and disvalue you and say that, that you're not going nowhere. Watch this. This It's the same thing of the spirituality that many folks unfortunately do in even our Western world culture. See, it's an Edomite mindset that speaks negative identity even over your own children. You, you ain't going to be nothing. You ain't going to go nowhere. You ain't going to do nothing successful. You ain't, ain't no more than, than your daddy or your mama that came before you. I know everybody right now saying this is probably an ouch moment, but I'm bringing relevance to you of understanding the depth of what Obadiah is speaking about uh, uh, as this is correlated to the spirituality of an individual. And now you can see for yourself, this is something that significantly speaks to each and every one of us because it begins to be what pushes your button about your value. It begins to be what pushes your button that causes you to activate your negative emotions about yourself. And the more that you activate those, the less that you allow the Lord God to be the biggest Victor in your life for you to allow him to prevail. So, so in that, listen to what Obadiah is saying. He says, he says, you've been made minuscule. You've been despised. You've been considered worthless by those who don't value you because they don't value me as the Lord God. So now what does the prophet say here in verse three? What does he say in verse three? He says, the pride of thy heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Okay, now. As, as we look at that verse, I want you to think about something right now because what's been the harmony line that enunciates the judgment of the Lord God on mankind and even the environment of the world is something that seems stringent that started in heavenly places. Why, why am I saying that? Well, look here at the beginning of this. It says, the pride of thine heart. See, watch this. All the other prophets that we've already looked at from the Old Testament, when it came to the wrath of the Lord God being activated on a people, one of the primary sins that they had was pride. Now, notice that I said pride because in that, I could have swore when we began to look at Lucifer in heaven, it was pride that was his demise. Now, I want you to hold your finger there, I'll give you a couple of other scriptures that I would like to quickly touch because you're gonna see how this brings to our attention. Could it be that the sin that has infected us as human beings is driven by the character of the sinful nature of Lucifer in his fall, which is pride. Pride often comes as the foundation that skews us 
into our uh, hunger for the sinful nature. And remember, sin is really unrighteous thinking, error thinking, flawed thinking when it comes in comparison to the word of the Lord God. So now watch, watch this. I'll give you a couple of verses, scriptures about this. In Proverbs 16, 18, the scripture says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit or elevated spirit before a fall. All right. So pride and haughtiness or, or elevating myself to being above the rest is what brings a fall and what brings destruction. Listen to what, what said. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. Are, are, are you listening to me? So let me continue to show you some things here because you, you'll, you'll begin to put this together. In the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, What else comes to our attention as I touch this is Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, what we come to discover here in verses 12 through 15. Scripture says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart... Or in thy thoughts, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Meaning I'll be in a high place. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. Uh, and north out of Hebrew means more than the cardinal direction. It also is a metaphor for uh, the mystic, the unknown, the unrevealed. All right. Now. It says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Once again, talking about being in a high place. In conjunction with that, when you turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19, scripture says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The stardust, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The worksmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And iniquity is the physical manifestation of one carrying out what is their sinful or unrighteous thinking. And if pride is a thought of one being arrogant, one being better than everything and everybody else, then it produces a manifestation of activity that's called iniquity. All right. It says, but the multitudes of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart or your thoughts was filled up because of thy beauty, which is thy pride. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanct uh, sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquity, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. 
Now, I read that to you because it begins to speak to you of the characteristic of the adversary. It begins to give you the characteristic of Lucifer uh, uh, in, the, in the descending of him based upon pride and arrogance that sets in. So now, watch this. I, I read that to bring you to this. Now, now as we look at verse 3 once again. It begins to speak to the characteristic of the adversary that yokes itself to the Edomites. Listen, listen, it says, the pride of thy heart, meaning the arrogance of your thoughts, have deceived thee, have misled thee, have fooled thee, made thee godless in your ways. It says, thou that dwellest in the cleft of the rock, meaning those who conceal themselves in the rock, or watch this, in your strongholds. Listen to what I'm saying. The word rock that's used here is Selah, S-E-L-A, uh, not S-E-L-A-H. S-E-L-A uh, uh, -E that's used here is the loft or, 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 or uh, fortress or stronghold that's in a elevated place. Now, in this, it says, whose habitation or dwelling is elevated, meaning it's not on ground level, it's in, in a high place, which metaphorically speaks to a celestial place or a heavenly place. But what the scripture says, you've concealed yourself in this, saith and saith in your heart or in your thought, who shall bring me down? Meaning you've gotten so arrogant as to the elevated place that you have been protected that now you think that you can't have any fault in you. You can't have any error in you. You can't have any mishap in you. You can't have anything uh, wrong with you because you have dwelt in such a high place for such a long period of time that nothing can touch you. So in this, you decide to bring this mindset that says, who can bring you down? Who can cause you to descend? Who is there that can make you decline to the ground or to the earth? That begins to speak very, very loudly right now. It speaks in volumes because in this, it would cause us as a believer in this dispensation to say, or have I gotten so comfortable in the Lord God that I think that I'm better than other individuals? Because if so, I'm developing the Edomite mindset that the Lord is going to end up dealing with me with the judgments that he have directed because it's that characteristic that he's displeased with. It's that characteristic that reminds him of the fall of Lucifer, who was in a heavenly place with the Lord God, but yet it was this mindset that began in him that produced things out of him that now we are being warned by the prophet Obadiah that this is one of the most sinful natures that can cause our our destruction. It's one of the most sinful natures that can cause our demise when it comes to the relationship that we have with the Lord God. So in that, let, let, let me touch one more verse on this evening. Verse four, it says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. He says, though you exalt or place yourself in a high place as the eagles. Now, what's interesting is that the correlation here or the metaphor is the use of the eagle. And for those who've been around ministry for a minute, especially those who are apostolic or prophetic, you understand that the eagle is also the symbol of the prophet. So that means that those who have exalted themselves as the eagles, it's being metaphorical that you have placed yourself so pridefully high because of what spiritual place that you're in. Some people think because they know something, 
Uh, feel, feel me, whatever. Some people think because they've got some profound revelation or they're so prophetic in some things that it makes them on another, another level which now can be dangerous when they think of themselves better than each and everybody else. It's one thing for them to have an anointing for the Lord, but it's another thing for them to to uh, uh, pimp and prostitute that anointing to say that they're better than everybody else and get to the mindset that there's no sin in them. There's no fault in them like it is for the sinner. So in this, watch this, he says, thou exalt thyself as the eagle and though thou set thy nest or your place of occupancy, the place that, that, that you stay all the time among the stars, it says, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Be it that you place yourself in the stars versus the Lord God doing it. He says, I've got to bring you down. See, the Lord God is the only one that puts you in heavenly places. You don't put yourself in a heavenly place. So this becomes the fault of a people that we see here in the text. And as I said before, when you look at this from the spiritual perspective, now you can see, hey, let me make sure I'm not guilty of this, even in this period of, of time, because I can just as much be as false as the Edomites, as we recognize here in the book of Obadiah. Amen. So, so, so with that, I leave that as food for thought on this evening, on this first teaching of the book of Obadiah. And I pray that it has been some profound revelation, not only in the historical, but to begin to shape your mind to understanding uh, what end time prophecy is all about and the things that trigger it, as well as what we as the believer should be assessing with ourselves as spiritual individuals that we're not guilty of the fault and we're trying to improve ourselves and make ourselves better based Based on the record of the word that's written in order to help us in our walk in the Lord. Amen, 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 and amen.